Yeah, it has. All right, so let's get going. So what we want to do when you're listening is I'm going to try and cover a whole, whole, um, whole range of different concepts that will be relatively new for everyone, okay? And we started this last week when we looked at the new idea of how we put electrons into orbitals. So we weren't using clouds anymore or shells. We've actually now jumped forward a few years um, and we're actually using the terms or the terminology for orbital. Now last week you remember, hopefully, that we talked about how we put electrons into orbitals. And we do it from the lowest energy first and we work our way up to the highest energy orbital. And last week I showed you a sequence. So you had to learn those that sequence, either with the table or the whatever system you want to use, but you have to be able to put electrons into orbitals, okay? With your eyes closed or moist. You won't get that in the exam or the test, you're gonna learn that, okay? These disappear from the board when you do a test as well. Not that they're gonna help you, all right? Um, but orbital notation, you have to stick in your head. So if I had sodium, for example, we have this idea of energy levels. And we talked about putting electrons um, into each of the orbitals. And last week we spoke about the fact that electrons travel in pairs and they have got opposite spins. Don't have to know why or how that happens. We just have to actually be familiar with it right now. So that was an introduction to orbital notation and I've used sodium metal as an example. Last week I said your big practical coming up that involves some of this equipment in front of me, like complicated bunks and burners and bits of wire and acid and samples of chemicals and all sorts of other weird and wonderful bits of equipment. And something you wouldn't have seen before is a spectroscope. You're gonna be using this for your practical, okay, over the course of this week. We've actually got uh, four lessons or so to complete the prac. Plenty of time. The practical itself is not complex, but the theory behind it is. Okay, it's a very simple practical in terms of method, um, but it's how you analyse the results, uh, which is important. So I now want to take you to, to that to that um, next level and explain what what this is used for, and how does it relate to orbital notation. So this is a spectroscope. It looks a little bit like a telescope. Okay, and if I were to open this up, right in the middle of the spectroscope, there is a prism. Okay, and you know, or you should know, if I put white light through a prism, what would I observe? I just get a spectrum, I get a visible spectrum. So if I were to go outside and point this at the sun, and we'll do this, okay, once we finish recording, um, if I were to even point it at these lights here, I'm just going to orientate it correctly, if I were to point it at these lights, I'm not seeing the whole visible spectrum, because these have got LEDs in these, I'm actually seeing a spectrum emitted from whatever the actual elements or elements are in those LED lights. I'm not seeing a visible spectrum. So inside of this, there is a prism. And what it does, it slows the light down and it divides it up into all of its different wavelengths. That's what the prism does, okay? So our spectroscope looks like this. Oops, that's a um, it Basically, it is a prism. And we're going to look into one side, okay, of the prism of our spectroscope, down the viewing end, you'll see there's one end that moves, okay, and you will actually focus it, this is the end that you look into, okay. So we'll get our spectroscope, knowing it in the middle is a, is a prism. So what we're going to do is, we are going to have a sample over here, which is our unknown. We're gonna actually look at a sample through the spectroscope. Now I introduced you to this last week. We said it was qualitative analysis. What does qualitative analysis mean? Hands up. What does qualitative refer to? Sam. The, yes, you can observe it. We talked about qualitative and quantitative. What's the difference? Qualitative, quantitative. Nathan. How pure it is, okay? So if you remember the word quality, what's the quality of it? So we're after how pure is this sample of unknown? This is called calcium carbonate. 
All right, so I know what it is. So if I were to test this, I should be able to observe a result for calcium, knowing that that's what's on the label. But I could actually give you any salt, and that's what you will be doing, you get three salts that you have to actually qualitatively analyse. You've got to work out what's in the salt. And the way we do that is atomic emission spectroscopy. New word, atomic emission spectroscopy. Okay, so I'm going to write that down somewhere. Atomic... Okay, atomic, get it right, atomic emission spectroscopy. So what we are doing is we are observing an unknown, okay? We're looking at the unknown through a spectroscope and using what we see, we're going to try and determine what the unknown is. However, it won't make much sense unless you know what we're going to see when we look through the spectroscope. So this is what you're going to see when you look through the spectroscope. I'm going to talk about what you're going to see first, and then I'm going to talk about why you see it next. Okay? So if I look through a spectroscope okay, at a metal, and it has to be in a certain uh, format, we're going to call it the excited state, and we, we introduced that to you last, last week. So this is the ground state for sodium. If I were to actually... Uh, heat that in some way, I have to turn it into the excited state. So I just can't put this here and look at it through the spectroscope and see anything. Because there's nothing happening with the sample. I have to actually change the atomic structure okay, of the sample before I can observe any changes. And the way that we do that, if you haven't already guessed, is with heat. Okay, through a Bunsen burner. This has got some errors in it, some inherent errors that we'll talk about a little bit later in the experiment, but I'm not going to give everything away right now. So we've got a spectroscope, we've got a sample. We have to actually excite the sample first or we won't see anything. So what we're going to see from an emission perspective, if you are looking on the Pratt sheet, and it's much easier for me to show you what they look like, because um, these are atomic emission spectra for a few salts, okay? However, it's not in colour, it's only black and white. However, it should be in colour to actually give you a better idea about what it looks like. So, if I were to run this through um, white light, that was white light, okay? What I'm seeing, if I had white light, would be the visible spectrum, red, orange, green, blue, indigo, violet. So if I walked outside now, I'd see a beautiful spectrum of the rainbow because I'm running white light through the prism. We're not going to see that though because we're going to be doing this in a darkened room. Okay, We try and black out the lab as much as what we can. We don't want any white light. We only want the light that's going to be produced from this salt in the flame. That's what we're after. And we want to try and not have any interference. Again, those of you that are thinking will think, wait a minute, how can we get rid of all the white light? Well, we can't, unless we have it in a total black environment. We won't have that. We can't block all the windows out in this lab. So we're looking at the emitted light, consequently emission, from our soul. Unknown. So what I see is, because it's not white light, it's emitting... I've got a black background. That's what I'm actually looking at. And then what I begin to see is a couple of things, depending on which way I orientate, uh, again, my spectroscope. And again, i just got to look at it, because what I'll do is, we'll do it like that. So I'm going to orientate the spectroscope, so I'm actually got red on the left-hand side when I'm looking at it. Red's that side and violet is on that side, okay? And people don't seem to understand that um, when we get into the experiment, all right, they've got some of them with red on the left, some with violet on the left. Whatever you determine from your data, okay, because we have to compare these spectras between metals, so you can't have 
a reference that's got red on the left, okay, but you're looking at your spectroscope upside down with violet on the left, okay, because it's not going to match. So you have to compare the same type of spectra. When you do your research, that will be obvious, I hope. All right, so I'm going to observe this through the spectroscope. And what I'm going to observe is a couple of things. You'll actually see what we call spectral lines. So I'll actually see maybe a couple of red lines here, like that. And then I might end up seeing maybe an orange line somewhere there. And then if you're lucky, you might see a, another line down there. So you don't see the entire spectra. You don't see the visible spectra, again, because we're not using white light. I'm seeing this spectra that's emitted from the calcium sample or wherever the sample is. Everyone cool with that? Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing. That's why it's called atomic emission spectra. So I take a salt, I excite it, I look at the spectra, and these things here are called the spectral lines. Alex, got a question? Yeah. So if you're going to use one of those devices to look at, um, you know, like, you know the old light bulbs? Yes. So do they emit white light? Yeah, they're, no, they've got, they've got tungsten. Oh, okay. So you would see the emission spectra for tungsten, that was the old filament. Okay. okay. So that would be the same as what we're doing with the uh, chemical. Same idea. Yeah. yeah. And they use electricity to excite the tungsten to heat it to white hot. So that's what you're seeing. All right. Not what well, these ones are different though, because these have got LEDs. I don't know what they're using LEDs, but there must be something there because it's not giving me a visible spectrum. It's giving me something like that when I point out the LEDs. Now, so so we're looking at our sample. Now we have to understand what the heat does. There's a great little diagram in your book that talks about how I take an element from the ground state to the excited state. Those words are very important. So this is sodium in the ground state. I'm going to put sodium into the excited state. Well, I can't just like... You know, sing and dance at it, it's not going to get very excited. I can't sing at it, can't. I have to actually apply heat. Okay? That's the only way you can do it. You could use electricity, okay? But of course, it's a bit difficult to do that in a lab. The simplest thing for us is just simply to heat it up in a Bunsen burner flame. So we put our sample into the flame. The, the actual the, the chemicals, or the, the, I should say the electrons, then have to absorb the heat. This is what happens. So as soon as I heat sodium, some of the electrons move up to the excited state. What's the sequence of orbitals after the 3s? Yeah. 3p. So we end up, although we're not sure, I, I can't actually identify exactly which electron goes where, but what I do know, by the way, is that the emission spectra for sodium is like a fingerprint. It's unique because no other element has the same configuration of sodium. And no other element excites the same electrons the same amount. They're all different. Otherwise, if they weren't, we couldn't do a qualitative analysis. Okay, they'd all be identical. That's the question in the hypothesis on the practical as well. So I hate it. So what happens? Well, as soon as I apply heat, just got my spectroscope there. As soon as I apply heat, the electron goes up to the higher energy level. I'm using only one electron. If there's four lines, there must be four different electrons and four different energy levels. If you're thinking, okay, the violet one is a high energy. Yeah. So that means somewhere up here, okay, on a really high energy. I might have actually pushed this one here, maybe it was that electron I pushed up to there, to that really high energy, okay, by heating it. That's the excited state of sodium, okay? So in order to get it from ground to excited, I heat it. And we're going to be doing four different methods that I'm going to explain in some detail in a minute, because some of them work really well, some of them not so well. 
And part of chemistry is also working out, well, if I'm going to do this experiment, what are the errors in the experiment? What's the best way of doing atomic emission spectra? That's ultimately what I want you to work out. Okay? What's the best method? But I'm giving you the methods. Normally you'd have to come up with the method yourself. All right, now, so where are we up to? So this is an excited state. It's not stable, okay? Yeah. So you can't run around, you know, you can't sprint 100 metres continuously. That's why it's 100 metres. You can only hold that energy level for a certain quantity of time. Unless you're super, superhuman and nobody in here is like that yet. Unless you're buying man and nobody is that. Well, maybe not. Anyway, so this... This now is unstable. So what happens is that it wants to get stable. The only way it can get stable is to get rid of the energy it's just absorbed. So what it does is these electrons come back down to the ground state. We heat it, the electrons come back down to the ground state. It's the only way it can do it because we can't maintain that high energy all the time. We heat the sodium, it absorbs the heat, electrons go up to the excited state, they're unstable, they come down. And that's it. So when you do the experiment, people think if I hold sodium in the flame for longer, it's going to keep on going up and down and up. No. Okay. The sodium will get excited. Okay. You'll see a colour emitted. And that's it. It only happens once. You can't keep on taking the same sample of sodium and keep on exciting it. To go and get some more sample, repeat the experiment again. All right. So what happens? This, these, or well, this energy is basically what we see. This is emitted as a photon of light. Photon is an energy level of light. Okay. Now, these things here correspond to spectral lines. To be accurate, I better get up on the right one. So if that was a very high energy shift, that would be over in the bottom. Okay? So that line, this one here, I can't say for sure. Okay? I'm just saying that one of the electrons is because of that energy change. It may not have been that one. It could have been something else. Okay? But I'm just saying this is the theory behind it. So that electron caused that spectral line because it was a big jump in energy. That's what I'm seeing through my spectroscope. Okay? I'll take my glasses off. Hold it that way. Okay. Now, obviously this one here could be the other one. So that might have corresponded to that line. Okay, in the spectra. That's the electron that was excited by that amount of energy to form that spectral line. Okay. So the theory behind it it's quite complex, all right, like I said, but to do the practical, it's, it's basic. Okay, it's not complex. So what we're trying to do is use atomic emission spectra to analyse a whole series of samples. But you're gonna, you've got a test to carry out first. You've got about six or eight of nine samples, and you're going to do it in the classroom. You're going to try and get the emission spectra Okay, in your table of results, you will produce one and you'll draw it up like that as much as what you can. I had people last year, um, and some of them didn't do too bad, um, they used their camera to take a photo. Okay, all right, so they used their camera to take a photo, and in some cases that worked, but not all. All right, it's very hard to focus that. Most people were observing it. And the easiest thing to do was to actually draw what they saw. Okay? So that's my recommendation. You can take photos if you want to, um, but it's really hard, you know, unless you've got a quite a spectacular um, camera and you're lucky to catch it at the right time. Because it does, it's not there all, all, all the time. It's only there for a split second. You could do that, Hassan, yeah. Some people, like in my last practical the science I was doing, uh, with tracking DNA, they did a time lapse uh, video. And you won't be able to pull that out. I, I don't know. Okay? It's up to you to work out how you're going to drag the results out. Alright, so that's the objective. Unknown salt at the end of the day. Okay? What sample is in there? So, what you'll end up with 
is a whole series of spectra that you're going to actually pull from the internet. So you'll have at your disposal a whole series of different spectra, ones you've recorded. So you might have sodium, then you have potassium, you might have the magnesium spectra. And you've got the spectral lines for all these. And none, no two are the same. As I've said before, they're all different because I've got different configurations, different electrons get excited. Got that, Sajjan? So what you do is, then you bring in your sample. You'll be given your unknown sample. I don't know what it is. You've got to do three of them. Okay? You run your unknown sample through one of these tests over here that I'll talk about in a minute. You record your spectra. Okay? So you record what you see. Obviously it has to be to the same scale. You can't just have these out of scale. And let's assume, for example, you end up with this. You've got three that you've actually tested, you've got the results for, and you've also gone away and you've actually researched these by the way, you've got the app for the data that you can pull down from the internet. Yeah. So here's the unknown, and the question is, what is in the sample of salt that you've given? Hands up if you can tell me which one it is, Harrison. It's going to be magnesium, excellent. So what you'll be doing is, you'll be using your ruler, you'll go across, and whatever line matches the spectral lines for the unknown, okay, is the unknown. So, tick, tick, you've identified they are the lines that completely overlap. So that must be your unknown sample. That's where we're heading in the experiment. Everyone happy with that? Yes. All right. Can't explain it any simpler. Sir. The method, Alex. Can you do? Like the underwater No, we're not going to do anything because we can't excite it underwater. It's going to cool down. Don't think so, Alex. No, I haven't seen any any emission spectra uh, done in aqueous. It, yeah, it does. So it wouldn't work. All right. Don't think so. Don't think so. Okay. Now, methods. Let me run you through the methods. So, need to still listen. These are the methods we're going to use. And I'll fill in the details as we go. All right, and there might not be method one for you, their the, the numbers might change. All right, now, method number one, and you will be moving through, we're going to have stations set up in the lab, which Miss um, Lofting's already done, you'll see you'll be working on a tray, for these reasons it's fairly messy. Um, and so method number one is using nichrome wire, and you'll be actually taking your sample, okay, You'll be washing the nichrome wire in some uh, hydrochloric acid, heating it. It's a very simple procedure, like I said, it's not rocket science. You'll take some of the salt sample that you'll have in a watch glass, and then using a peg, not your fingers, you'll place it, whoops, you'll place it in the flame. You're going to do that maybe three or four times until you get a really good spectra that you can draw. So method number one, okay, will be, I'll call this one here, I'll call that just the wire method. Just the wire method. Now you won't all get a chance to do that, okay? Because there simply won't be enough. Well, we might, we'll see how we go. But you're normally going to be doing at least, you have to do at least two methods. But you won't get to all four, I don't think. All right, method number one is the wire method. Method number two is a soaked toothpick method. Now, basically what happens is it comes out in the same container, but what Miss Lofting has done is, she's got toothpicks in here that have been sitting in the solution, the solution's in the container as well, and you'll actually use some tweezers and pegs, and 
you'll put the toothpick in the flame of the salt that's been dissolved. So method number two is, we'll call that, this one here is the, the toothpick method, and you get pretty good results from that one. Okay? So toothpick method is really quite, quite effective. Well, I think it is. Um, that's up to you to prove that. Okay? So you'll need to see what results you get from that method. All right, method number three is a bit messy. Well, three and four are both messy, actually. Method three. Method three, you need to have something behind your, um, your flame. Because method number three uses a spray bottle of the liquid, of the salt solution. So if I were to test this sample, I need to dissolve it into water first, it goes into a small spray bottle, and then I need to spray it into the flame. By the way, it's the blue flame, it's not the safety flame, it's the blue flame that we're doing this with. Okay, and again, we are recording the spectra. Okay, as we do that. It's quite a messy one because you've got fine mist spray going everywhere. So you'll have gloves and the bench will be pretty much covered so you don't make a mess. So there is also a method, okay, and this method here uses a spray method. Question, mate? What? No, this is different again. Okay? Alright, so method number three is a spray method. Okay? Now, method number four, and I have to get the piece of equipment. Okay? Now, this one is quite complex, and you'll need to watch. It looks a bit strange, um, but it actually works, and I explain the concept behind this one. Um, so, this one has got obviously a, uh, a pet bottle, empty bottle, okay. Uh, this is hooked up to the Bunsen burner and we clamp this, alright, with a retort stand. This is open, okay. So this is a spray method, a bit on steroids, okay. Now, the air hole here is open on the Bunsen burner. So this creates a vacuum, okay. We get the spray bottle and we spray that into here and because it's a vacuum, basically, gas is going to that way, the, the mist gets absorbed up through the bumps and burner, goes out to the top, okay, and we get, again, the spectra. Okay, now, so this method is, is probably the best one and everyone should try to get to this method. Okay, Alex? Yeah, of course it does, Alex, yeah. Yeah, That's but you did, no, you did flame test last year. Yeah. You didn't have one of these. So we're looking at the flame You're looking at the spectra now. We're going to the next level up. Okay? Next level up. Okay. So this one, call that the, the, uh, the bottle method, if you want to, the pet method, the Coke bottle method. Um, but this is how it works. I won't set it up, all right? But you'll see that set up before you tomorrow. Okay. Questions? Yeah. You've got to do at least two methods, at least two, if, you, if you've read the experiment, at least two, but I'd like to try and give everyone at least to have a go at this one if we can. We're going to have two benches set up for this one. Okay, now, very quickly, last thing. While I'm recording, I might as well give you a few little hints. You need to discuss not just well, two methods in some detail, um, but you also need to, in your write-up, talk about which one gave the best results and why, and it also means talking about all the errors in the experiment. Now, you'll also get a handout shortly that will talk about systematic errors, random errors, precision, and accuracy. Things we haven't talked about yet, okay? So, We'll be teaching that as we go. So if you think about it, this bottle, these are actually labelled. And this is labelled for strontium. So the only chemical we ever put through this Bunsen burner since it was brand new 
is strontium nothing else. So think about that. So you can't just use this for strontium, sodium, magnesium, calcium. So at your bench, you'll have about four of these set up, okay? But they'll all be labelled, and you can't put anything else through that one apart from strontium. Can you work out why? Hands up. Amir. Yeah. Exactly. We don't want to contaminate, first of all, we would call this our test chemicals. So if they're contaminated, if we have our, our actual metallic salts contaminated, it's going to really, really confuse our results for the unknown. So we try and keep it as pure as possible. So we only use one type of metal in the spray system. The next one. The wire one. Now, you don't get, well, you get a whole lot of different wires that you use, okay? But one thing you don't get with a wire system is, you only get one months and burner. And you're going to test sodium, uh, magnesium, calcium, uh, strontium. So you're going to test a whole range of metals using the wire method. For the same months and burner. Okay? Now, for those of you that are listening really carefully, okay, you, what you'll find is in the procedure, this is inherent, it's got lots and lots, okay, of random error in it. Okay? Also, it will affect the outcome, it will affect the actual the answer, which is a systematic error. Alright? And you'll even find that when you tap the Bunsen burner on the bench, depending on who used it last, Okay, you're going to get a whole range of different colours come up through that Bunsen burner. Okay, so when you're using this method, okay, um, it's sometimes a good idea, when the Bunsen burner is cool, to try and have it as clean as possible. And that might mean unscrewing the cylinder. This one hasn't been cleaned, I can see it's got salt there from last year already. So that means making sure that it's as clean as possible. You have to write this in your procedures and methods of improvement for the methods that you are working with. How can I reduce the errors in this experiment? Okay, now, without giving too much more away, Alex, I'm still talking, um, everything that I've been through today, that's the basic, that's the foundation really uh, for our practical. That's the next step in terms of our theory as well, All right, is how we use the spectroscope, what this relates to. Any questions? Each method, Son. Each method, each method yes, each method will give you a different spectrum. Well, let me rephrase that. It should give me a different spectrum. It should. Okay? However, when you do some of these methods, as some students found out last year, when we had all this uh, stuff going on, some of them found out that they did, I think they did four or five samples of metals, right? And they had all their spectra lined up, and they were almost all identical. The same, right? So they had sodium, look like that. Magnesium, look like that. Calcium, look like that. Strontium, look like that. So you've got to ask yourself, what was happening in the experiment to cause that error? Why was it that all the spectra for the salts looked the same? Because you know the theory behind it, they shouldn't be the same. So if you are getting the same, son, it tells me something about maybe there's contamination in the Bunsen burner. Maybe... Maybe someone has been funny and labelled all the chemicals with different labels, but they're actually all the same chemical. So you've got to actually think, how can that error occur? Okay? What's the cause of that error? Alright? And of course, not just the cause, how does it affect my results? Fairly obvious. They're all going to be the same. Alright? And how can I improve that error? How do I fix it for next time? There's a whole lot of things you can go down the list and say, have I checked this? Have I checked this? Have I checked this? 
some things are in your control, some things aren't out of your control. Okay? Alright, questions? Alright, we'll leave it there.